You are listening to Exploring Sacred with your host, Denise Iwana Francisco, on the Temple Within Radio and Digital Media Network, giving voice to the sacred. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a beautiful brand new day. It's a gorgeous day here in the Enchanted Forest at the School of Sacred Studies and at my home. It's sunny, it's cool, there are no little bugs floating around in the air, and that's always a good thing when you're having your coffee out on the lanai in the morning uh, with your favorite little (laughs) Jack Russell terrier. I almost said terror. Sometimes he is a terror. But it's a beautiful day, and I'm happy to be here with each and every one of you talking about talk about bugs in the air. This morning we're talking about parasites. We're talking about psychic parasites. And what does that mean? And where did all of my energy go anyway? Right? How did that happen? Why is this perpetual feeling of doom and gloom or nagging or whatever it happens to be? Why is that present with me? So this morning I'm welcoming everybody into the chat room. Good morning, Janet Smith. It's good to see you in the chat room this morning. And uh, if you would care to join us, please do. It's easy. Thank you to everyone who continues to become a follower of my program here on Spreaker. Uh, That makes me feel really good to know that you are enjoying what it is that is being presented here. And uh, gives me an opportunity to interact with with so many beautiful souls. That would be you. So I'm going to go ahead and post that link over in the Exploring Sacred page on Facebook so that everybody can find me. Good morning, Lily. It's good to have you in the chat room and here on the show. All right. Okay. There we have it. Chat room link is posted on the Exploring Sacred page. Last week when we were all together, we talked about emotional vampires. And it's funny, the conversations that have rolled up since we all got together and talked about psychic vampires together on the show last week. And uh, even on Mother's Day, good morning, Holly. Uh, Mother's Day afternoon, my mother-in-law, Janice Francisco, said, gee, you know, I listened to that show and I had to stop and think about all of the times that I I may have been an emotional vampire. And I said to myself, well, I hope everyone can forgive me for those times that I was needy, uh, something like that. And I said, well, I think that we can all be that. I mean, there are times in our lives, naturally, naturally, where we can be needy of attention or affection or a shoulder or an ear. And that's all perfectly good and well. It's when things are out of balance Right. It's about balancing heaven and earth. Good morning, Katie Battle. It's good to see you in the chat room as well. Psychic parasites, what are they? Well, first of all, let's talk about that word psychic. Because some people hear that word psychic and either their ro- eyeballs roll to the back of their head or they roll from side to side or they run screaming from the room, depending on what their perception of that word psychic is. So for me, keeping everything simple is a good thing, and I'm going to keep it simple this morning. That word psychic means of the soul. It's pertaining to the soul. And we all have one of those, I think pretty much. I've met a couple of people in my lifetime that seemed a little soulless, but I'm certain that they have one. And so taking good care of our soul. Hey, girl. Hey, joy, new joy. It's good to see you, Rhonda. And my sister Barbara Dullknife is calling all at the same time. It's a hopping morning, isn't it? When we take care of our soul, when we take a look around to see who the psychic vampires are and who the emotional vampires are and take a look at our own selves to see if we've become that or when we've been that or if it's gone unchecked, that's a good thing. It's good to nurture our soul and to take good care of it. I often think to myself, in fact, just this morning as I was getting ready for the show, 
thinking to myself at the age of 56, how much differently I feel about this particular subject matter. In fact, a lot of subject matters in my life. And, you know, I was thinking to myself as I was making my bed, isn't it interesting, Dana, that when we first begin the spiritual path, the path firmly on the path, compassion for everyone seems to lead the way. And perhaps we're taught that we have to be compassionate and kind and loving and nurturing and caring. And that perhaps maybe we should be the person to parent everybody, to be the good, loving, kind parent to everyone. And then along the way, as you get older, you discover that, you know, tough love is a good thing. Tough love is a good thing. And pretty soon that tough love and the compassion meld into something that says, but what about me? What about compassion for me? And what about tough love that's going to nurture me? In other words, tough love, making those decisions to say that I do count, that I do matter. I have value. My love has value. And the value of my love is not going to be based on how much abuse it can take, right? And when I think about abuse, or if I think about what it is that sits in my heart, and perhaps they sit in your heart as well, what is it that sits in our heart? It sits in our psyche, in our soul. What is it that sits in our mind? in our memory bank, in our blood, in our bones. What is that? Well, sometimes what we have tagging along with us, like barnacles, I love that word barnacle, like barnacles, (laughs) are psychic parasites. What is a psychic parasite? Sometimes a psychic parasite can be a thought that we cannot let go of. Maybe it's a thought about ourselves. Maybe it's a thought about another person or a thought about a circumstance, a thought about a group of people, a thought about all kinds of sorts of things, about a family dynamic. There are times in our lives, I believe, when we need to sit and take a really good look at our psychic parasites, those that are clinging to our mind. Are we still thinking about ourselves in the term terms that we thought about ourselves in high school or college. Sometimes, and I guess that's a whole other show, a case of arrested development, right? Some people are still living 1981, the year I graduated from high school. They haven't moved off a dime. And it's good to have a young soul. If somebody asked me, you know, how how young are you at heart? I'm still 17, right? I'm still that same year that Fleetwood Mac's Rumor album came out. So in that space. But what about our our maturation, the maturation of our soul? Am I still thinking about groups of people or situations or myself? Am I holding on to thoughts that really need to be processed and let go of? Are they weighing me down? Are they just weighing my mind down? Sometimes we say our mind is heavy. Our mind is heavy with thoughts. And sometimes we just numb ourselves to the heaviness of those thoughts. I think it's good sometimes to sit with those thoughts and really think about, well, where did that start? I often use the example of, good morning, Angie, the example of, oh, thank you, Rhonda. She said, you are doing a show that resonates with my life as we speak. Thank you. I appreciate that very, very greatly. When I was a young girl, I wanted to play baseball. And back then, girls didn't play baseball. They Maybe they played softball or wiffle ball or something like that, and that's good too. But when I was six, five, six, I wanted to play baseball. And there were only boy teams. And I remember the coach Even though I was that young, the coach telling my dad, the Sarge, she's a girl, she can't play on this team. And my dad said, like, hell, she can't. (laughs) She's going to. 
And so I remember, you know, being a feminist at the ripe old age of five, right, getting on that boys baseball team. And yes, I was relegated to playing catcher, which served me really in great ways later on when we won the city championship in high school there in Apple Valley. But the point of it all is that for some people at a very young age, there can be a thought implanted in their mind. She's a girl. She can't do that. That perhaps sits with them for the rest of their lives. Who are you to do that? She can't do that. What? Who told her she could do that? Sometimes we need to go that far back to take a look at the psychic parasites that have been clinging to our psyche since we were very, very young and taking a realistic look at it. Well, geez, I was six years old back then. Well, what it did for me back then is it fueled the fire of, really? (laughs) Who says I can't? I'm going to. And at least I'll give it a try. It may not work out, but I'm going to give it a try. And for others, and at other times in our lives, we're told things, hurtful things, shameful things, petty things, lies. That sit. They just sit. We're coming up on a beautiful full moon here which is why I'm doing this show today. Full moon, beautiful full moon that says to us, take a look. Take a look. Right now it's time to pluck the parasites, those things that have been sitting and draining your energy, morphing your memory bank. It is amazing how one single parasite in your memory can transform all of the memories attached to that single moment in time. We can base an entire thought form and way of living based on a parasite that we were given at a very young age. It can form us. It can form us. And what about those emotional parasites? What do I mean by that? Well, yesterday... I was having a long conversation with Sandra Herrick about our show tonight. We started talking about death and dying, which is not anything that's new for Sandy and I to talk about as a couple of Scorpios. But what about those emotional parasites that came upon us as young people? Maybe the first time that we went to a funeral. Maybe we went to our very first funeral at a very young age. And the emotion of everyone around us and the emotion of us as a young person still sits there. And so a fear of funerals, a fear of death, continues to walk with us for the rest of our days through the lens of an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old. Maybe the emotional parasite attached to a funeral is going to a funeral and what the pastor, the minister, the rabbi, the imam, or the priest, what they had to say was emotionally hurtful. And it sits in our emotional bank for a very long time. I call those kinds of emotional parasites that come from religious experiences Um, opportunities to take a realistic look at religion. I've been to more than one funeral for somebody who has taken their own life, only to hear the minister or the pastor or the, the priest declare that this person would be wandering the ages in a place of suspended animation, a.k.a. hell. And typically in those occasions when I hear that kind of blather, Um, I will talk to the pastor or (laughs) the minister or the priest afterward. Why Why are you leaving that thought? Why are you leaving that emotion with the people who were here today? That emotion will sit within them for the rest of their lives. Well, that's what I was taught to say. Well, have you ever examined what you were taught to say? Do we examine what it is that we say on a daily basis? I happen to think that silence is golden. 
And when somebody goes radio silent, perhaps it's an opportunity for them to gather their wits about them before, before emotional parasites emerge, right? As anger, rage, maybe an opportunity to sit with it and be with it and balance that before we offer our thoughts the way we feel about something. Silence is a beautiful thing when we feel maybe we're going to be out of control with what it is that we're going to say or project. Because those projections, the anger, the rage, even if it is justified anger or rage, if it is not in control or balanced, balanced in meaning or why, why it's coming to fruition, you know, what is the basis for your rage? If it is not rational, if it is not rational, the hurt from that emotional parasite can go on forever. Words can create some of the most harmful psychic soul parasites ever in a human lifetime. And not only human lifetime, but with every living thing, every living thing. Yes. Another one of our parasites, psychic parasites that reside in our soul, I believe happens to be attached to memories, memories, ancestral memories, personal memories, group memories that sit deep, deep, deep inside. And maybe we tucked them away because they were too painful of an experience to experience and to process at any given time in our life. And eventually they become something that drains our energy. I once heard somebody say that some of our most painful memories are like beach balls. We can hold them under the waters of our psyche for a very long time, for as long as we have the strength to hold that beach ball under the water of our psyche until eventually it just pops up and it comes to the surface. When parasites need to be extracted, and so maybe it's something that's been draining your memory bank, your heart, your love, your joy for a very long time. And when that beach ball of what we've held under in in our emotions and in our psyche, the waters of our psyche, when it finally pops up and it reveals a pattern of thoughts, emotions that are not in balance, a memory, a trauma, or even maybe a revelation of a psychic or an emotional vampire in your life. It's a wonderful opportunity for healing. When that beach ball pops up, it is a great way of knowing, okay, there's something I need to look at. There's a parasite here that I need to pluck from the system. It's no different than those woodland ticks, you know, that that we see. Sometimes we find them on our dog or uh, sometimes they land on us. Eventually, Eventually, they drain so much blood from us that they literally explode. The same thing happens with psychic parasites. Eventually, they drain so much blood from us that they explode and we are left to heal, to move forward, to recognize, oh my goodness, I had no idea that it was that particular circumstance in my life. It was that person that memory, that thought form, that trauma that I had been holding under the surface for so long. And maybe there are a lot of them. Maybe one thought led to the next and to the next and to the next and to the next. And sometimes it depends on the age we are. I think next week, as we're getting ready for for Memorial Day. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. In recognition of Memorial Day, I'm going to talk about, and many of you can relate to this, what it is to be the son or a daughter of a military veteran, to be a spouse of a military veteran, 
You see, when I was five years old, six years old, when my father, the Sarge, came back from Vietnam, I remember, I remember the day we picked him up at the airport in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I remember it like it was yesterday. Every nuance. And I remember the cassette tapes that he would send and would be listened to around the dinner table and you could hear the mortars going off and and all of those kinds of things. And so at five years old, six years old, I had a thought form about war and I knew who my father was before he went off to Vietnam. The man who came back was not the same man who went. And for a six-year-old, it's confusing. 50 years later, and now understanding that both the Sarge and my biological father, I mean, between them, from what I understand now, between the Sarge and my biological father, they both served uh, seven tours of war duty between two men. What I understood about my father being different at the age of six and what that meant, the anger, etc., etc., and now understanding it at the age of 56, it leaves a space for that parasite of what happened to my daddy. Where did he go? How come he's so angry now? To come to understand, and I can take a look at that now at this age and say, now I see, now I understand. Depending on the lens that we're looking through, the parasite will reside in that particular age or decade of our life. Sometimes a psychic parasite can be a person. It can be a person. And I guess we could compare it to being a psychic vampire, except the vampire goes home and sleeps at night. Right when the full or in the in the daytime, when the sun rises, the vampire goes back into their coffin. The psychic parasite, on the other hand, just never goes to sleep. <laughs> it's always there, and it's always draining our energy. It can be draining our joy. They can be draining our joy, and we all have those people in our lives. It's different than being an emotional vampire in that it never stops. So usually when we talk about a soul vampire and a soul parasite, it's two different things. So for a soul parasite, it's typically somebody that we're living with or that we see all the time someone who is in our life. And it can also be, if we don't live with them and we don't see them, it can be a relative that we are connected to by blood. The blood of our blood and the bones of our bones, as Amantha Murphy always says. Good morning, Audra. Even from a distance, because of the blood connection, a soul parasite can be a relative. And that can be a good thing or it can be parasitic, a drain, a constant drain. So what do we do about all of these parasites? Well, it takes some meditation, takes some self-awareness, being aware and awake to what it is that raises our emotional level, to our feeling drained, triggered, what is the source of the trigger? What is the source of the anger, of the rage? What is the source of the melancholy? What is the source of the distrust, of the self-doubt? What is the source of that? If you are somebody who's always self-doubting, you know who, who you are because you're always doubting yourself. Or maybe you're always hard on yourself. What is the source of that really? When you get to the source of that, that is where the parasite lays or lies. And again, the parasite can be a thought, an emotion, a memory, a trauma, a family member. Lots of ways that something within us that makes us feel less than or angered or where did my joy go? You ever think that to yourself? 
I used to be a really joyful person. Where did it go? Where did my happiness go? And when you drill down with that question as you get older, when you drill down and you find the source of it, sometimes we've contributed to that, by the way. We can contribute to our own psychic parasites because we can be enablers. Well, they just don't know any better. I guess I've just got to be there for them because they can't live life without me. What's going to happen to them if I don't just let them be (laughs) parasitic off of my goodness and my whatever, whatever? So sometimes we do have a hand in it. And sometimes in, in drilling down, we do need to find a counselor or a therapist. Because sometimes we can only get so far before we get to the source of the parasite and we just can't get any further. Maybe the trauma is too deep. Maybe the sorrow is too strong. And we need somebody to help us through that. And that's okay. That's good. Why would we let a parasite drain us when we're not going to let that happen to our dog or to our cat or to our horses, right? We're going to make sure that they take their tick and flea medicine. We're going to make sure to brush them, to comb them, to go through their fur and their hair, to make sure that they are parasite free. Well, why don't we do that for ourselves? What it comes down to really is what it comes down to. And that is finding the source of why is the pervasive melancholy always there? What is the source of that? Sometimes a shamanic practice or a practitioner will help us get to the source of things. Oftentimes working with a therapist, a counselor, maybe your rabbi or your priest, whatever it happens to be for you. Oftentimes, again, we get to the place where we need an assist And then plucking it out, letting the wound heal. It is amazing when you pull a tick off of a dog. I was sitting up at my brother Guy's, getting ready for Homblech, and one of his dogs, his cute little white dog, looked like Gabriel, only bigger. He had some ticks on him. And, you know, so I pulled them off. You know, just like an old cave woman there was pulling these ticks off this poor dog. I would not let that dog suffer with those. I would not let those a dog suffer. We can only do our work for ourselves. So as much as we'd like to pull a parasite off of somebody else, unless they ask, uh, it's usually not something that we're capable of doing. And usually until the beach ball pops up from underneath the surface, we really aren't even aware sometimes that it's there for us to take a look at and to toss around, bring back the joy. Hey, Susan Brown. (laughs) Everybody. Good morning, Cousin Johnny. Self-sabotage. Absolutely, Janet. Self-sabotage. Taking a look at that. The week after Memorial Day, geez, Kelly and Kevin and Lily will be here. We're going to put up a new NEP, new sweat lodge. The DNR has granted permission to go out and get some willow saplings. So us, along with Claudia and her wonderful husband, Dick, we're going to go harvest willows out on state lands and rebuild the sweat lodge. It's time for new bones. Isn't that interesting? It's time for new bones. At the same time that um, we'll be putting the teepee back up, out back, so that it's here for my sisters when they get here in June. So the teepee will be up, the NEP will be refreshed and renewed. And then I travel to Florida to meet my cousin Johnny and my cousin Corey for the very first time, my mother's relatives. My relatives. And to sit with that and to be with that and to look at them face to face and to give them a hug. That's going to bring up for me in good ways things that I can let go of. Things that I can rethink. Things that I can reformat. 
Sometimes some of the greatest parasites we can have is what we've been told about a circumstance in our lives or about somebody in our lives. Or maybe our own thoughts because we just don't know. For an adopted person, you just wonder your whole life. You just wonder and you go by whatever it was that your adoptive parents were told and are willing to share. You go by what other people have formed in your thoughts about who this person could possibly be. And one day the truth appears. Anybody ever have that out there? One day you have a thought form about something and one day it all comes to light. And it takes a minute, it can take your breath away to stop and to have to rethink and remove the parasite of previous thoughts that maybe were given and then grew inside you. Yeah, I'm very excited for that too. Good morning, Katie. It's good to see you. Good to have you in the chat room. Psychic parasites, soul drains. Every so often we need to take a look, just like we do with our dog and cats. We need to inspect ourselves inside and out to see what it is that's lingering. And what about those psychic parasites that live in the, the etheric realm? They exist. Not everything in the divacanic realm, the astral realm, the angelic realm, the shashuptic realm, the divacanic realm. Not everything there is pure light and love. It may have been born of love, but it serves a different purpose at times. Psychic vampires, psychic, what do I want to say about this? Attack, psychic parasites are very real. Taking good care of our mental, emotional, physical body, as we've been talking about, is very important. It's also really important to take care of our soul body, our energy body, our spiritual body. That's the fourth side of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Actually, there are eight faces on that pyramid, but typically what the human eye sees is the four. Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, the spiritual body. In the spiritual plane, in the etheric plane, what spirit sees of us sometimes is our human body, but most often not. Most often not. We may appear to spirit in the form of a color, an octave, a tone, a frequency, a light. Not always our human cloak is seen. I learned this, geez, a long time ago. I was speaking with a medicine woman. A wian waka, right? Wian woman, waka, holy, holy woman. And she was one of the first people to teach me that spirits don't always see our human figure. They will see our soul essence, and it may appear as a color. Again, a vibration, an octave, a light. And if our light, our octave, our vibration, our color is appealing to a vampire on the other side of the veil, a parasite on the other side of the veil, they will attempt to drain from us what it is that they seek. Locally, I was speaking with uh, an elder, a tribal elder, and she taught me about uh, the colors of ribbon skirts and sometimes the colors of regalia. Uh, locally, the colors of regalia attract spirit. So if we look at somebody who has regalia and the regalia, maybe it's oranges and yellows. It's a vibration that they are attuned to themselves. They like it. It's those colors that spirit sees them by. At other times, spirit will tell us, I see you in this color. This is how you appear to me. Interesting 
how indigenous elders and indigenous spiritual leaders right can take us into unknown territories i never knew that before then and since then in the past 15 years i've become very well educated to exactly what both of them were talking to me about we're more than our human body we are light we are love and there is an emanation <laughs> yeah susan remember that night there at your home Oh, Susan has an exquisite home there at the foothills of the Monadnack uh, Mountains, out east there by Sandy Herrick. And we weren't in her home, what, 10 minutes, Susan, for that class? And before long, we had dozens of coyotes out just outside of her house, yelping and singing for us. They recognized the gathering the gathering of souls there in her home. It was magnificent. It was beautiful. They were singing to us beautifully. And yes, Rob, energy is the current is currency on the other side. Yes. Energy is currency. One of the places that people will rarely find me is in an old tavern, unless I'm in Europe and right all they have are old taverns. But before I go into an old tavern, whether it's here in Lowell, Michigan for taco night, or if we're in some place in Europe, I'm very mindfully and consciously aware of going into what could be a feast for psychic parasites. Anywhere that we find people enjoying what weakens the energy system, so whether that is a tavern where people are enjoying alcohol or a crack house or any other such thing, a big party where people are enjoying what weakens the systems is where we're going to find a huge, <laughs> it's like the fruit flies, right? In the fruit that you forgot to throw out, you lift up the half rotten orange and a whole swarm of fruit flies flies out well let me tell you same thing happens in taverns and bars and big parties and you know all of those kind of places and because I can see them I can be pretty much consciously aware of what I'm looking at and mindful of what is around me most people are not most people are not there are vampires that are draining energies from the other side because a lot of times people in those places do not have their wits completely about them. For a lot of the years in my life, I had, uh, not friends, family members who would tease me because I, I have never ever been drunk in my life. Doesn't mean that I don't enjoy a glass of wine, but I can honestly say I've not ever been drunk. Why won't you just let your hair down and have fun and blah? Because I was also incredibly aware, even at the ripe old age of five, that I'm never alone in the room and by golly, I'm going to have my wits about me at all times to the best of my ability. Because parasites also happen when we are sick when we are weakened in any way. So it isn't always drugs and alcohol. Sometimes it's when we become ill. And that is why people will say, will you pray for me? I'm not feeling well. Well, those prayers not only help the energy of the body of the person who is ill, but it also builds up a force field around that person. So that parasites from the realm of the unseen world do not drain them as readily. As readily. Really, the course of the modern day mystic or the modern day seer is to understand that the seen and the unseen worlds are all connected. They are real and walking in balance. It doesn't mean never have apple pie a la mode or you don't ever have, you know, never have a drink or whatever. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is balance is a good thing, particularly when you understand that you are already a psychic sensitive. If you are already a seer, 
Understand what it is that's seeing you. Understand what it is that lives within you and around you. Our thoughts, our memories, our ancestral traumas are very much alive in the energy within the pools of our psyche, of our soul. They become parasitic when we do not pluck them, when we become aware of them. Sometimes we're not even aware of them until much later in our lives. But sometimes people will say, well, just let bygones be bygones. Well, okay, if that works for you, but on my side of that bygone, I'm going to take a look at where it may still be harming me. On their side of the bygone being a bygone, they can let that go, but I need to see if there's something within me that is still draining energy from me, taking my joy from me. I need to see that and work with that. Just putting, putting my head in the sand really just doesn't work for me. Let's have a look at that. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It, does, it can be honest and healing. Better take a look. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Audra. Would this be similar to attachments that, yes, yeah, sometimes these parasites are like big balls of energy attachments on people. Sometimes we'll hear and this expression. When she drinks, she's not the same person. Something comes over her. When he drinks, it's like he's left the room and somebody else has walked in. Well, everybody, that happens. That happens. As much as we like to think that everything that, every one that passes, you know, gets a free pass directly to the sum, summer land, right? To Valhalla or wherever, there are earthbound spirits. Everywhere. This is probably part of the, the word psychic that makes people run screaming from the room, but all of you, we can have a, a decent discussion about this. And yes, it's no different than sometimes we find out that a friend really isn't a friend, but somebody that wanted to ride our shirt tail, that wanted to ride our joy, that wanted to be where the good party was. And as soon as that gig is done, they're gone. And you've all experienced that. Well, they were there for the good times. Then what happened? All of a sudden it got ugly and they left or I had to push them out. It's really good to check ourselves, even, you know, for myself, even when I go shopping, and we all know how much I love to shop. Oy vey, yikes, I can't stand shopping. Because we don't know. Being mindful and consciously aware of your energy. If you come away from an event and you don't feel like yourself, Maybe that's because you're not alone. Maybe you're feeling the presence of another. What do you do about any of that? Well, there are lots of practical things. It doesn't take a magic wand. You know, if a parasite's been there a long time and it's a doozy, that's another story. It could take some assistance. But if you've gone to, to some place, let's just say you went to a family dinner. And oh, Lordy, that family member that no one can stand because they're a harper and a complainer and a whiner and ugh. You leave thinking, why do I do this to myself? Ugh, I feel like I've, <laughs> whatever. What do you do about that? Well, one of the greatest things you can do is go home and take a shower. Head to toe, take a shower. Take a bath. Wash that right out of your hair. Wash it right out of your body. You come home from a bar, you come home from a party, take a shower. Clean yourself up. At the very least, spritz yourself with some lavender or something soothing. Go lay out in the grass. I remember years ago, I met Sonia Choquette for the first time at her home in Chicago. And there we were sitting in her living room. And she looked at me and she said, you know, all of this really isn't that complicated. 
If you're feeling overwhelmed with spirit, if you've been somewhere and you feel like you picked something up, she said, you know, one of the greatest healers that we have at our assistance, for our assistance, is Mother Earth. And I looked at her and she looked at me and she said, your homework after you leave my home in Chicago today is to drive back to your house and go out into your lawn and lay on your back and gaze up at the sky and release to Mother Earth anything that is clinging to you in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts, in your spirit body. Ask Grandmother to take it from you and to fill you back up with goodness. And she said, and if, you know, you don't feel like laying on your back, take your shoes and socks off. Take off those pumps. I had on a pair of really expensive pumps when I went to see her back in those days, right? All of my tailored suits and matching pumps and Louis Vuitton handbags and Gucci handbags those days, which have sailed around about that time, actually. <laughs> Come to think of it, I sold all that stuff off. Go stand in the grass with your bare feet. In the winter, if you need to bring in a box of dirt, bring in a box of dirt. The earth of, of Mother Earth is healing. Well, after meeting with Sonia, because she's a pretty wise woman... That was, oh my goodness, that was 26 years ago that she and I had tea at her home. I changed a lot of things. I went from the tailored suits and the matching pumps and the she-she handbags. Not that it's, that's a bad thing. I'm not saying that. It was, for me, those days were now done. They had come to a conclusion. And that's when I took on more of the Stevie Nicks way of dressing, right? my real hero <laughs> to let the energy flow and to be I've always liked to be barefoot ever since I was a little girl you could my parents could hardly get a pair of shoes on me and god forbid if my mother ever put on a pair of those horrible saddle shoes you know the white ones with black oh I would purposefully ride my bike and drag my toes until they got holes in them because I just didn't want to wear those. They were dreadful, and they hurt. I just wanted to be barefoot. So being aware of the parasites, being aware that the unseen realm is exquisite, it is beautiful, it is full of so much light and joy and love, and it is also full of, just like the playground of life, those that would tend to be a bully. Be honest about that. And even if you're a good person, that doesn't mean that you're not going to pick, pick up a hitchhiker the next time you go to a tavern, pool tournament, right? Let me look here. Yes, dark entities do have an intuition of their own, Holly. Yep, yeah. there's a consciousness to everything in the universe. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, that is very true. Rob is saying, I've read someone who opined that World War II began to turn after Hitler stopped his public speeches. They energized him like musicians on stage consuming the crowd energy. Yes, without a doubt, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Alcatraz for me. That's right. That's right, Rhonda. Katie Battle is saying, my dog and I buried my shoes in the garden after my mom told me that I had to wear shoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the older we get, we can become weary from carrying around the parasites of our past or the way that we perceive our past or the way that we were told and what we were told about our past. We can become weary carrying ancestral trauma. David Sturkin and I, Cad, me and Cad, were headed on down to Georgia in June to participate in an ancestral healing weekend. 
event. That'll be interesting. The two women who are facilitating the weekend are both uh, psychologists, I believe, but also practitioners of the Orisha persuasion. So that will be interesting, and I will be personally prepared for that. Orisha is not a religion, or I should say a path, that I follow. It is in my bloodline, uh, but I do not follow it. So I'm prepared for that African religion being used. And so my African ancestry will be there with me, and I will be aware that I am also a pipe carrier, Chanupa. So so let's talk about that for a moment. So I know that I'm going down to Georgia and with my dear friend, David Sturkin, and we're going to be participating in what four days of. There's a great book by the, a man by the name of Daniel Four, F-O-O-R. And he's done wonderful work with uh, ancestor and ancestral memories and through the teachings of Orisha of the Orisha. So I call my brother Guy, you know, he helps teach me about the ways and about spirit as it pertains to me as a pipe carrier and a ceremonialist. And I said to him, you know, I'm going down for this. And he said, that's good. It's good to be in other people's ceremonies and to learn and, and to be with those different kinds of spirits and be polite, but, you know, be prepared. Don't go in there uh, without thinking to yourself that you carry a Chanupa and they carry a different way. And you both work with spirits in the unseen world. Well, it's not unseen to you, he said, and he laughed. You see it. Yes. Be aware. He said something that was so beautiful. We were talking and he said, you know, sister, I've been teaching you for a long time. In fact, I have it on here. Uh, What did he say to me? By now we've taught you many things. (laughs) <laughs> he said, by now we've taught you many things. And one more thing I'm going to teach you is when you're going to somebody else's ceremony, be aware. Let your spirit be aware. Not only your eyes and your ears and your mind, your brain, let your spirit be aware of what is going on. That's beautiful. If you're in a group of people, be mindful of who's in the group and who's with them in that group, right? Going in, yes, Daniel 4, yep. Rob is saying, when ancestral trauma contains alcoholism, it makes for interesting times. Yes. Yes, Audra, you can. You can educate them. She's asking, can we help friends who work in bars who may not be aware of entities? Yes. I will say to somebody who works in a bar, I have a client who owns a couple of taverns here in Michigan. And I, in conversation with her, I said, so when you go to work every day, are you sure to clean the entities out of your bar for your patrons who are there eating? Think about that. Not only are they drinking, but they're eating. She said, what? I said, do you clean it energetically? She said, no, how? I said, well, you know, the easiest way is to invite the archangels, Mikael, Uriel, Raphael, Gavrael, Michael, Uriel, Gabriel, Raphael, to sweep through your bar, taking out any negativity, any dark entities, and to bring in the light so that when people come into your establishment, they have good conversation. There's laughter, there's joy. Oh, I never thought of that, she said, and I am going to do it. So yes, you can, and it's not that hard. It's, uh, okay, it can be hard if it's some something that's maybe something dreadful happened in that place. So we have to gauge it by the establishment we're talking about. Yes. Yes, the ancestral trauma of any form of addiction, mental illness, disease of the body, any of those things can really make things interesting. But particularly addictions and uh, mental illness, drilling down to find the source of it, to take care of it, to balance it out. That's what it's all about, being awake and aware. 
and loving yourself enough to say, I'm going to get well. I'm no longer going to carry that burden, that parasite. I'm no longer going to continue to parent everybody in my life because we know when we first bring babies into the world, they, we love them. They're very draining because they're very needy. <laughs> they need us. We're it. And at some point we allow them to grow up and move out and have families of their own, but then there are circumstances for some people where they have to declare emancipation from their children or their parents or whomever else it is that continues to want to be parented. It's very parasitic. Before you go into a place of ceremony or a class in spirituality or spiritualism or healing or what have you, be awake and aware. Ask your guardian angels, ask the creator, ask your own infinite intelligence, your soul intelligence to be aware, to help protect you from. Maybe you do it as you're picking out what you're going to wear to that event, right? We go through our closet and we pick and choose, oh, should I wear this shirt with that? And what about the shoes that I'm going to wear? But what about dressing your energy body? Maybe you do wear a talisman when you go. Maybe you do wear a protective piece when you go. Anybody who knows me knows that no matter what ceremony or gathering I'm going to, my medicine pouch is on me somewhere. Always. Yes, I give power to it. Some people say, well, why do you need that? Well, why do you need clothes? I guess we could all walk around naked. That would be all right for some people. <laughs> Not me. You know what I'm saying? So we have to be, what do I want to say? Practical. Practical. And if we find out that someone in our lives is being parasitic, then we can have an, an honest conversation. They may not like it. You may not like it because maybe they feel you're being parasitic. Or the thoughts or memories that you've placed within them has been harmful. Kids are a great reflection, aren't they? But mom, what about the time you did? Well, honey, you have to remember you were only six. Well, what about that time you wouldn't let me get my nose pierced? Well, Elise, you were only four when you wanted your nose pierced. And I really didn't think that that was a good idea. So if you're still holding on to the hurt of mom saying to you at four, no, honey, you already have your ears pierced. And I really don't think getting your nose pierced at four is a good idea. Then, right? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's so practical. It's so easy, but in our humanness, we can make it so hard. In other words, it's time to take a look at where the dust bunnies are rolling around, everybody. It's spring. We're coming up on a beautiful full moon. Where are the dust bunnies in your life? Time to sweep them out. Take a look at them if they need to be looked at. If you've got dust bunnies in your aura... Where did those come from? At the very least, I know here where I am, it's a beautiful day outside. Go lay out on Grandmother Earth and ask her to take those dust bunnies, those parasites away. And if you need assistance with it, pick up the phone, make an email. There are lots of wonderful therapists and counselors out there that can help and shamans that can help. Let this particular springtime be liberating for you. Liberate yourself and bring back your joy. We came here to have joy as part of our human experience, not to lug around a lot of barnacles, seen and unseen. That's just, I don't believe that that's what we were meant to do. <laughs> oh, yes. Clean up your aura, clean up the dust bunnies, likes attract. If you're harbor harboring a lot of garbuncles and things like that on the hull of your ship, of your being, you're going to attract more. Clean it up. Clean it out. If you're afraid to have joy because you've never had joy, at least give it a try. Some people don't know what to do with joy because they've never had joy. And joy frightens them. For some people, being sober frightens them. 
I say, at least give it a try. Give it a whirl. See if it works. If you're somebody who just can't stand to be outdoors, give it a whirl. Go lay out on Grandmother Earth, or at the very least, take off your shoes. Maybe you walk in your socks, and maybe you'll get brave enough to take your socks off. Heal. I believe that we are in a time on this earth plane of great healing. Personally, planetarily, communities, clans, thought forms. And usually what happens before the healing is the band-aid is ripped off. The parasites are discovered and we begin to pluck them and examine them. And we begin to get sober about our lives. We give joy an opportunity to come for the first time or maybe back again. Our sense of adventure, our sense of self, our sense of strength. For some people, strength can be frightening. Give it a try. For some people, being healthy is frightening. Who am I if I'm not always sick? Who will I be then if I don't have that? I say, give it a whirl. Try it out. Enjoy the process of it. Enjoy the journey of it. With that, everybody, thank you for being you. Thank you for joining me this morning. It has been fantastic. And uh, get out there and shine as only you can shine. Blessings be, everybody. Have a good day.